Canada, you'd be hard pressed to find somebody who could identify Matthew or, or even knows his music. And I think um, he's just an everyday person here. Can you tell me who Matthew Leanne is? By name, no. No. <gasps> yes. Um, in, a few months ago, I saw him on TV. He, I think he came in like sixth place in Survivor. And then when you go to Taiwan, it's a little bit surreal because he is so popular. I'm not famous. It's just that millions of people think I am. I had emotional responses to music from a very young age. And I can remember learning to play the piano by myself when I was in the fourth grade. As I, as I got older, into my teenage years especially, music became very important and extremely important uh, method for me to express many of those very confusing, deeply emotional, tumultuous things that you feel during those years. His mother, she was a guitar strummer, and, and I like music, and there's sort of music in the family. I started playing here at the TNM. It was the first time that I was really charged with having to carry an evening as a professional musician. You know, you'd be in here and you'd play all your covers, and you'd party, and the next day you sleep until two, crawl out of bed. Pretty soon you realize that you're spending six out of seven nights of every week extremely intoxicated. You sang Mr. Wojangles for my mother. Did I? <laughs> no. <laughs> Tell her I'll never forgive her for requesting this. <laughs> my work in the bars was completely impairing my ability to write my own music. I had to draw the line and say, okay, no more cover music, no more bar gigs. I wanted to be known for my own music. As soon as I discovered that the studio was a limitless world where I could create anything I could imagine, I was combining nature sounds with music right from the beginning. There was never a difference between musical instruments and the sounds of nature. If we stop and listen, we are moved by the sound of wind through the trees, by the sound of the ocean, a stream, birds, animals. He does incredible work in collecting sound of animals um, in the Arctic. Recording in nature is like going on a pilgrimage. You don't know what you'll get, but you have faith that because you're putting out that effort to go find something, that nature will give you something. We should leave, leave that, because that's the this classic. Is the start of the loom right yeah. here? That's the classic loom call. Oh. Yeah, that's right, that's the dive call. I kind of, I kind of like that. My th thinking was that the caribou section went on a little, a little bit long. Yeah. I love that. I love those loons that, that so, they sound like they're laughing. My album, Bleeding Wolves, was picked up by a record company, a small independent record company that was based in Taipei. The inspiration for that project was primarily environmental, a wolf kill program that I'd been fighting in the Yukon and it sold quite well. So they began to put more promotional effort behind it, and they got it into the mainstream record store network. The record company was receiving letters, full-blown testimonials about how this music was changing people's lives. It was really becoming a phenomenon of sorts. Matthew's uh, trying to bring awareness to the environment of people. He talks about uh, the Yukon and its, uh, and its environment, and it, it, it strikes a chord with people in Taiwan. When we arrived in Taiwan, Matthew just released Voyage to Paradise, and the album was released the same week that Eric Clapton, Sting, and the Backstreet Boys had released albums. Matthew's album was outperforming those three artists on the chart. When you tour as much as I do, and you're away recording, you tend to spend a lot of time away from home. In fact, home is where you are the least. So musicians for the tour, we're going with the same lineup, which means that you'll need to confirm everybody more dates, more time. It starts as soon as I board the plane in Vancouver. The passengers recognize me, the flight attendants whisper to one another, is that him? And then you get off the plane and you're surrounded by cameras and reporters. We're up at probably six in the morning. And in the course of the day, we will cover off a myriad of 
radio, television, newspaper, and magazine. And then it's off to straight to the venue where we were playing and uh, sound checks, rehearsals, more interviews. They approach him on the street, they ask him for autographs. I have signed anything from cell phones to uh, keychains to shirts to skin, you know, whatever they enthusiastically want me to sign. You can't even walk through the streets without sort of being mobbed by fans. And he's adopted their culture and they've taken him in. He understands the sentiment of the local people, more so I think than most uh, musicians who show up and play over there. And that may be why he's, they've taken him in. In 1999, I released an album that was my interpretation of Taiwan's Aboriginal uh, and traditional music, as well as the sounds of its environment. And it was sort of my exploration of Taiwan's culture. That album was released right after the earthquake in Taiwan. And the people of Taiwan are like, are like a big family. And whatever happens to them in any part of the island seems to impact the whole collective group. When I first heard about this disaster, it was like if you heard about uh, your a relative becoming ill, but the relative lives in another part of the country, you immediately want to go there and be with them. And he went over and, and retooled his tour to make it an earthquake relief concert. So we weren't sure what the turnout was going to be, but. The album I was releasing was getting a lot of airplay, and I had been touring the epicenter area, and the, the square began to fill with thousands of people, and it was a sea of people. There was such an emotional energy in the air. 30,000 people came out for his concert, this entire population of the territory come into one concert. It was so powerful, so incredible. And we performed like we had never performed that music before. At the end of the event, we received a standing ovation encore. This got louder and louder. And ah. Okay, excellent. Well, your Mandarin is really good. Getting bigger all the time. I mean, we were just in tears, you know, really moved. We raised over $600,000 Canadian for earthquake relief there. Matthew has been, he has uh, been appointed special envoy to, to Taiwan by the Yukon Territorial Government here. And, um, and he's, he's been a great ambassador for both the Yukon and Canada there. And he's also been um, appointed um, ambassador to river culture in Kaohsiung County. Where I'm asked to meet with political leaders, with cultural leaders, Aboriginal representatives, uh, environmental representatives. That has uh, had me meeting with the Prime Minister of Taiwan and, and uh, performing for the President. I find the people in Taiwan to be very sincere and very emotionally accessible. Um, it's the one reason I think that I've resonated so strongly with Taiwan. So I'll be doing a project which is my emotional image, I guess, of Taiwan. Whatever I feel strongly about is what I will create with music. You're an emissary, you're a recording artist, you're any number of things for any number of people. And to come back to the Yukon, come back home, and to hear your daughter's voice say, Daddy, you know, it's that sparks something in your heart that is the truest of all the other stuff. You ready to skate? You excited to skate? Amy is an amazing individual. She's an inspiration to me for sure. Being a father has affected my songwriting. You develop these incredible protective responses and and you also start to think a lot about the future of the world, the future of the planet. And that's really sharpened the edge of my thinking where environmental issues are concerned. And I feel grateful in a way that I can leave the superstardom overseas and come back to a place like this where you can just be real with people.